always remember to put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you help other people. Health is one of the things that is very important. You yourself need to be very healthy in order to take care of the people that is around you. Today, we are going to listen to Sigep to see how can you improve your health, eat healthily, uh, based on the concept and book from Deep Nutrition. All right, let's go and learn something. Yeah, uh, okay, my name is Sigep. So today I'm going to present, uh, do a book review of a book called Deep, uh, Deep Nutrition. Okay. Um, so this is a book that was uh, recommended to me by random person on the internet. So I like to go around Twitter and read about a lot of topics. Like if you are also interested in geeking around, actually, that's a very good place. If you follow the right people, the algorithm actually lets you follow even more people and you get a lot of different views. A lot of times the views are actually contradictory. So it means that although I'm giving a book review on this book, uh, I don't necessarily agree with everything. Right? I just want to share what was in the book and then maybe say a little bit about what I think about certain things. And uh, this is a book review, right? This is not a presentation. This is not a, like an official presentation. So it means that like a book club, it should be a little bit informal. So I think I'm okay if you ask some questions uh, along the way. Okay. So uh, this is a 2008 book revised in 2016 by a doctor. Her name is uh, Catherine Shanahan. It is a very, very thick book, right? Uh, I think I have a copy here. Uh, 400, 400 word pages. So you see, it's a, it's a very, very, very thick book. <laughs> so it has a lot of details and I don't think I can cover everything. And a lot of the details she shared are really uh, good for me because I like to read about details. Although sometimes you don't need to know the details. Um, as a technical person, I like to know. <laughs> okay. And uh, this book is divided into three parts. So I decided to also share this presentation in three three portions. Uh, why did it? Why did it quit? Did it? Um, yeah, it's connecting back. But why did it stop? Yeah, let's try again. Okay. Do I need to like keep moving the mouse to the? Uh, I, I so. Okay. Um, you divide into three parts. The wisdom of tradition. She talked a little bit about. I would say it gives you some background, a small background of the nutrition for our ancestors. Um, it also talked about uh, why nutrition is important. So it actually gave you, it gave me some motivation to understand why I should pay attention to nutrition and what is the impact of uh, how I choose uh, the type of food that I eat. Then the last part, the second part would be the dangers of the modern diet. Uh, and so, uh, she mentioned a lot of things, but I think the main thing that is in that chapter is mainly about the bad fats and sugar. And then the last part is living the deep nutrition way, where she has some guidelines on what kind of food you can eat uh, to have good nutrition. So I, um, because there's a lot of information around nutrition, I decide to share more of the interesting parts I saw in the book that could be a little bit out of the norm. Uh, but I, I feel like because that's a bit different, it's a good thing to share. And lastly, this is not medical advice. So <laughs> this is a uh, book sharing and this is more personal opinion and not, not, not medical advice. And uh, we, consult, consult a doctor. we should always uh, consult the professionals uh, or doctors uh, if you want to make a very big shift in uh, your habits. Okay, part one, uh, wisdom of tradition. So, um, what you want to say is that you can look at a picture of uh, a lot of the people from the past and you can say that they even look at their faces or look at their bodies. A lot of them have very, very strong uh, looks and 
they look very tough because they were tough. Uh, they were actually able to do a lot of things. They have a lot of stamina, a lot of strengths. Uh, the only reason why I think they didn't live in general, you know, the life expectancy wasn't so good, was mainly because I think there were a lot of diseases in the past, a lot of war, a lot of this kind of thing. If they didn't, you know, if their life, the average lifespan wouldn't cut short, I think still a lot of people in the past, if they didn't get disease or weren't killed early, they were able to live for a relatively long period of time as well. And no matter where they were from, they intuitively knew what food was good and not, right? Because they have a culture over thousands of years. They, they always pick, they, they knew like, if I eat this food, I don't feel good. So they pass down to the, the next generation. No, like, it is, it is, they sort of sort out what food was good and what food was not. And if you look at the people now, our grandparents living to 80 years or 90 years old, they also grew up in general with a different diet than the young people today. So that's why, and then this book was written by somebody from the US. So in the US, the food for young people was basically uh, processed yeah. food, right? Right on it. Uh, McDonald's considered still okay, right? I mean, <laughs> it's it's still processed food, but compared to everything that you buy packaged in the supermarket, right? That's actually worse because McDonald's still have it's not healthy food, but it still have the basic uh, nutrition. Uh, and one last thing that I really like when what she mentioned is um, good food in the past have been dealt. So our ancestors passed down food from the past until now. Uh, because they were both nutritious and delicious. So I like I like this because uh, what she's trying to say is that if you you like to eat a lot of nutritious food, it sh it should be delicious as well. Yeah. Okay. So this is already something that's new to me, right? Epigenetics. What's epigenetics? Uh, she have a lot of uh, a lot of these scientific terms there. I try not to. I keep them to the minimum, but it will appear throughout this presentation. <laughs> so epigenetics. Yeah. The. Oh, okay. It's, it's can you can you yeah. also open the team just in case oh. the display have a problem? Is it interference? Huh? Yeah, I think the wireless display have some. It's, it's through Wi-Fi, right? So I think it should be. Yeah. Uh, just in case the display go away, right? Can you open your team so that you can actually? Yeah. Yeah. Let it go back to the wireless. It's okay. Look, that's for the glitches for those that I don't know. The slide on the room doesn't change. <laughs> yeah, that's this the fix that. Okay, now now we are in the time for a selfie. Uh, yeah, all of my for a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> so that when we uh so get. You can speak a bit louder, a bit. Oh, louder, a bit. Because the room, yes. Just increase the volume. Okay. Oh, it's pizza. Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> okay. Uh, everyone can hear me. All right. Um. Epigenetics is a study of how your behavior and environment causes changes that affect the way your genes work. What they're trying to say is that the gene and your DNA in your body is not set in stone. It means that when your environment can change, it can change, right? The way you grow will change, right? And uh, there is a diagram here. I, I got it online. It shows uh, the person and then it shows the uh, genetic profile. And then it shows all the environmental things that impact them, right? The food that they eat, the things they inject in the body, their activity, do they smoke, uh, you know, do they have stress, uh, the, the friendship, you know, all the things 
uh, that happen in your life actually impacts their genetics and impacts their uh, expression. So the way I can think about it is that genes, the way I, my conclusion was that the genes are like a blueprint, right? It's like, this is how you want the person to grow. And then the diet and behavior are like the bill of materials, the bomb, right? So if you want to manage a project, you want to get it done, you need resources, right? You need resources, you need material. And if your um, and 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 the body would have to adapt to what resources and material that you have, right? If I don't have enough calcium, then you not and you don't have enough vitamin D, then although it try to build the bone, it would be, the bone would not be very good, right? The shape may not be right, right? And uh, and so a lot of times, let's say that we started off in the childhood probably with less nutrition, so our health maybe is not good. What she's trying to say is that. Yeah, a lot of things are not going to change, but if you can have good nutrition, a lot of these mistakes that you made in the past, they can actually be corrected because let's say I don't have enough calcium and vitamin D for the bones, but in the later on, I try to take more of those and then the body will recognize it and then actually help you to build stronger bones. This one is uh, the impact. Epigenetics also talk about the impact of the next generation. Right. This is another reason why uh, she mentioned that nutrition is important because you know, whatever whatever um, health situation you have now, it will be uh, transformed to your next generation, and and diseases or problems would actually get worse and worse this generation. In fact, she mentioned that she's a lot of cases, and this is in USA. She saw that the uh, the grandmother was usually very very strong and fit. Uh, and very healthy, but as they move on to the next generations, right, they get less and less healthy until uh, the the child have more development problems. They have very bad teeth, or you know, they get weak and don't look very strong and things like that. Here is an example of uh, the impact of smoking and how smoking actually uh, can the impact of smoking can be felt long after. The, the generation of the smoker. So let's say your mother is a smoker, right? Then the child would have 1.5x chance higher risk having asthma. So the interesting part is the second part, a smoker grandmother. If the grandmother was a smoker, there's a 1.8x risk of uh, having asthmatic children. So this is a case where the mother is not a smoker, right? The grandmother smoked, the mother did not smoke, but the child had a higher risk of asthma. Then, of course, the third one is the worst, right? Because both the mother and the grandmother were smokers. That's 2.6x, a lot higher. So if a lot of bad habits, uh, if you have a lot of bad habits, it's actually not just felt by the next generation, but, uh, but the further generations. Uh, this is what she called the greatest gift. He says that... Um, her argument is that traditional diets are more nutritious. And there's a picture of a goat in the, I think, in Africa. So a lot of these pictures are playing a fight because I grabbed them from the book and then I couldn't find the color version. Yeah, so apologies for that. Uh, they, they, like she mentioned the goat where the goat was uh, eating grass and walking around naturally and the people getting all the nutrients uh, from there. Another thing is that uh, this is, I think, some study by uh, Weston Price, I think a uh, very famous uh, dentist who went around the world to look at nutrition. And he was comparing, I think, 100 years ago, the diet between the Eskimo and the normal white man at the time. And what he found was uh, when he go and analyze the nutrition of the diet, they found that all these things like calcium, 5X, magnesium, 8X, uh, vitamins, 10X, uh, the, the people who live on their traditional diet had a lot more nutrients compared to the normal people with them. So uh, the, the question would be, um, you know that there is something called a recommended dietary allowance. It means in the, in the packaging, they'll tell you, oh, this is how much vitamin and this is how many percent of the RDA. So it means that you're recommended to take how much, you know, how much nutrition as, as uh, daily. Right. But um, if the RDA was based on what the normal person was eating, 
right? Then the traditional diet is actually a lot more influence compared to the RDA. So one question mark that she would give is that, are we actually deficient in nutrients? So, um, so that's why we should always look back. Uh, that's why she thinks that we should always look back into the past uh, because uh, they, they eat nutritious uh, diets. And as mentioned before in the epigenetic side, if you give the nutrition that the genes expect, the health will blossom. And it says that all over the world, right, people have different diets. She, she gave an example, right, Thai, a Danish, Ethiopian. They all look very good, very healthy bones, very uh, healthy look. And they took very different diets, right? Africa and Europe and Asia, they take the, the, the type of food they eat are very different, right? But they all managed to have good health. So it means that the, the traditional people have found out how to find food that can give them the, uh, give them the nutrition that they need. Right? For instance, in, um, they mentioned in Africa or wherever, places where you have not many plants, right? Uh, people make, a lot of the Europeans go there, they get scurvy. Scurvy is, a, is a, uh, you get scurvy if you lack of vitamin C. Right, but if there's all, all animals there, you know, in all plants, they don't have any source of vitamin C. But actually, when they talk to some of the tribes there, and in general, the tribes also try to keep this a secret <laughs> for whatever reason, because tribal knowledge seems to be, you know, they want to spread through the tribe only. They will tell, they will tell their uh, people that uh, if you kill an animal, right, you look for the kidney and then there's some flat glob above the kidney, you should eat that. So actually, that lob above the kidney is the adrenal glands. And actually that is very, very high in vitamin C. So the so they don't know what's vitamin C, right? But they found a way, they, they somehow knew how to find sources of those nutrition in the area. Uh, dynamic symmetry and beauty. So this one is a little bit uh, out, but uh but she mentioned a lot, so I want to talk about it. She talked about the golden ratio, right, of phi. And this phi is something that um, people, scientists around the world, when they study uh, organic things, they, and actually even the stock market, they will notice that there are trend, they are, they are things that uh, conform to certain ratios. Right, it means that the, the length of your arm versus the, the whole length of your arm and then the length of your, the whole arm versus only the forearm, they are some ratio, right? Or the face, right? The ratio between the width, the height, the distance between here and here, all those things can be measured. And a lot of the things actually conform to the golden ratio. And so anything that we perceive to be beautiful usually conform to the golden ratio. And she, she also mentioned that if your nutrition is good, Ideally, you want to follow the blueprint, so you, you have a good. Uh, if you if you can follow a good nutrition, the body would more likely follow the golden ratio. It means that people, you will, you, you if you are still young, you will grow up to have very good development of your body. And if your kids also take that, they will also have a uh, good good uh, development. And also mentioned before the epigenetics, right? The more good habits you have, the more good offspring you have, right? So maybe a lot of people who look very good now is because their grandmother and grandfather were probably very, very healthy, right? They eat traditional diet. And maybe, right, although they could look good, right, maybe two or three generations later, if they do not take care, they may start to have problems as well. Okay, so this is something, this is not in the book, right? This is something I just uh, play around because when I read about Golden Asia, I geek, geek in the internet. I look for, there was an app that actually measure your face. Uh, what, how, how close are you to the golden ratio? So this is my face. They say it's uh, 8.1. So I say, okay, yeah, pass uh, 8.1 out of 10, right? Then I, this is for fun only, uh, huh? Then I check Gollum, uh, uh, <laughs> Gollum with 8.5. So um, I think um, it tells me that, uh, the people who make the movie, I think they maintain the ratio very well. <laughs> of whoever, you know, face the model for Gordon, right? They, they try to make him ugly, but the ratio is actually pretty good, right? 
but but I did lose some confidence, right? Because uh, it's not so good. But also, it's interesting, right? It, it means it's not just the color or the look; it's the ratio, of the face. So I tried to find somebody who is really ugly, uh, on the internet, and yeah. So just to make sure the app is not cheating me, yeah, right? So uh, I found uh, that uh, yeah, if the face is totally out of the ratio, you get a very very bad score. So finally, I found somebody who I think the face look good. Uh, this is uh, Aaron Kwok. Uh, he got a score on nine point four. Right, so it 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 it's in a way it's a little scientific, right? Because uh, it will tell you that uh, a face that you find very desirable would often actually follow the golden ratio. <laughs> okay, the Marquard mask. Marquard is the name of uh, I think a plastic surgeon, and what he did was that uh, he played around with this. Uh, Golden ratio sub, right? And he actually, I don't know how he created this, but it's a face template that consists of a lot of the, so he makes sure that they follow the symmetrical patterns and all those golden ratio stuff. And he, he superimposed this mask on top of people, right? And then when you do that, you found out that no people who look more attractive, they adhere to the mask. There are more examples, right? You can see, it's a bit black and white, right? So maybe if I share the slide, what you can see more clearly, you can see that the mask actually, all these different faces, they all look different, right? But when they put the mask on, the location of all those uh, parts of the face actually match and actually fills out the mask. This is a picture of the author herself. She also do the test. And her comment is that uh, if you look over here at, the, at this area, at the cheeks, right? It has a, there's a hole there actually, right? It means her face that did not fill out the mask in that region, right? Yeah. yeah, so he said that actually she blamed her nutrition when she was young, it was not very good. So maybe that caused the bone development to be uh, not very good, right? And uh, yeah, by the way, right, Mark, as I said, this is a plastic surgeon. She didn't do any plastic surgery, yeah, but uh, the still that see, I think one of the things they do is that they try to whatever changes they do right they try to match the mask, and usually that would be a very very good uh, change to the looks of the person if they follow the mask because you know that um, the ratio is off right you notice that person looks weird right we we, we somehow recognize uh, we we somehow can recognize uh, this kind of uh, this kind of pattern in nature. So this is a slightly different topic, also a wisdom of tradition. Uh, she said that pregnancy uh, has a very huge nutritional demand on the body, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are really deficient in nutrition, right? Because all the priority is given to the fetus. And actually, it would take things from the mom's body just to make sure that the fetus is healthy. Okay. And if you and if they mentioned that if you look at the the mom right uh, if the mom is not good in nutrition the they'll be very weak because you know what the energy you give to the baby and also the bones right they say that a lot of there are some um, uh, people after pregnant right they actually have curved spine because the spine weakened and so they will have their problems right they have weak bones curved spine and it also needs some very healthy fats from the brain so it actually takes away some of the brain of the mom as well. So it means a lot of, sometimes the mom can become uh, forgetful and maybe, you know, forgetful and some cases, you know, bad mood or depression. It's not, I don't think it's completely uh, true, right? But it may be related, right? Why, why the mom would have some, some mental problems. Uh, uh, maybe not the mental health problem. I think maybe just how I mentioned forgetfulness is something that may happen if, if the baby needs the nutrition and it takes from the mom. Something he learned from a lot of the uh, people also is that uh, there would be, because the mom gives all the nutrients to the baby, uh, it takes a very long time to replenish, especially if your nutrition is not very good. So he f she found that in a lot of cultures, they actually have a, they enforce some kind of gap between the, the children, the first child, the next child, and the next. And they actually recommend somewhere around three years. 
but if it's less than three years, then you need really, really need to replenish the nutrients more. And because of uh, because of this, and this is her hypothesis, right? It's not. I don't think it's completely proven yet, but this is what she wrote in the book. Uh, there would be some kind of shift in the look uh, of the children if they have a different birth order. So let's say the first child versus the second child. Sometimes the first and second child almost the same. Maybe the third child will have a shift in symmetry. Just like I mentioned that symmetry is how they see a face that's good, right? Both sides look very similar and the ratios are good. Uh, she gives some examples, right, of celebrities. I don't really know who is uh, Matt and Kevin Dillon. So if somebody a uh, fan, let me know. And then Paris and Nikki Hilton. The left side is the firstborn. The right side is the second born. Usually the face, they will be, they all look, they still look good, right, in general. But there is some change in the symmetry when you go from the first to the second. Uh, she will talk about the, the prominent parts are actually like the jawbone, the cheekbone, and then the, the brow. How prominent are all these features uh, on the, uh, on the, on the, on the, but between the, the first and the second. So uh, he's just saying that she, she, she uh, is a hypothesis, but she actually looked through a lot of information. Go to year, go look at first and second sibling and, and, and see how far away were they from each other. And she found that trend was true. Uh, another one is not really that important, but uh, is, she mentioned that the second sibling Due to the way the, I just found an interesting point, right? It's not that important, but she said that a lot of times the second sibling have actually more feminine features because of the way the hormone or estrogen in the mom would uh, would um, change after the pregnancy, right? So I mean, what what they're trying to say is that uh, there is impact, right, of nutrition uh, of the mom and and the order of the of the siblings. So here are some other things. I, I won't go through all the words, right? Uh, some problems with, uh, you know, why symmetry is important and, and, and why, you know, epigenetics and nutrition is important, right? Because if your bones are not symmetrical, the larger parts are not symmetrical, you have even more problems, right? If your, if your foot is not even, you get a lot of pain, right? If your jaw is not well developed, you have issues with wisdom teeth. If your eye socket is not developed, maybe you have some vision problems, right? So all these things are you need to consider, right? Uh, so you should try to um, keep your yourself healthy so that you have less of these kind of symmetry issues. Because uh, you know if the baby is have an alcoholic mother, that's a very sad thing because there are lots of issues uh, corresponding to that. Uh, here's an example, right? Of how this kind of thing can impact the way you look, right? Like the left hand right is the same person before and after the surgery, right? He had an underdeveloped jaw, right? That caused the, the face to actually look like that. And once he corrected it, you can see there's a very, very big change of how you perceive that person. Okay, uh, the second part, right? Uh, the dangers of modern diet. Uh, he talked about the great nutrition uh, migration, the way people think about food uh, and the habits of people have changed during the past five generations, which actually correspond to the, you know, the industrial revolution and things like that. In the past, people only talk about food as food, right? Today I'll eat this food. Uh, people will go home and eat delicious food, right? Balanced food. But now uh, I'm also guilty, right? Uh, People would just talk about food as carbohydrate, protein, and fats, <laughs> right? Uh, and people would would like split everything out uh, and analyze them bit by bit. So the problem with that food has now become uh, isolated and broken down. They don't think of it in the original form, right? And because of that, right, they just say, "Oh yeah, I just need some carbs and protein and fat." I just I'm joining things together, you know, and then make all kinds of different kind of food. So you see, uh, they can actually have very basic ingredients that they can mix and match. Because now they don't look at food as a whole thing. They don't look at the nutrition as a whole thing. 
they just say that, oh, I know I just need um, top and protein, some fat. They don't care inside the fat, is it good? Do they have nutrients inside? Inside the protein, is it good? That's it, nutrient. Inside the carbohydrate, is it? Because of, if you eat the cup in a fruit versus you eat the sugar, right? It's a little bit different. But the nutrition is different. So what they now, now they, they isolate everything. They'll take the basic ingredient they go and make into different things. So for instance, um, you have ramen, which is like uh, the, the ramen or instant noodle, cereals, bread, and donuts. You think about it, right? The material is almost the same, right? They'll just use some flour, some sugar, some, uh, now they'll add some coloring and some food, artificial flavor. They just change the ratio a little bit. They put some flavor there, right? They are different products. Like the like all the all the junk food, all the snacks, right? I think they're almost the same. They just put different flavoring, right? Some some uh, prawn flavoring, chicken flavoring, vegetable flavoring, or what? But the main material is the same. So it means that you're not really getting a diverse amount of uh, nutrition. And you contrast that to traditional food, right? Traditional food, but on their own, if you eat it, they are flavorful and tasty. There's a lot of natural juices and flavor inside the food that makes us like to eat those kind of traditional food. Um, so most of the normal people will eat things in the supermarket. Uh, so she gave an example of, uh, okay. So uh, they talk about what do the, really a bit funny, like she said that normal people eat things in the supermarket. What do, what do the leaders eat? Right. Uh, so this was the menu in the President Obama's uh, second inaugural lunch. In the in the menu, right, was uh, lobster tail, uh, clam chowder with cream sauce, uh, bison uh, tenderloin with uh, veal demi glaze, uh, golden beets, green beans, strawberry preserve, red cabbage, uh, even the dessert, right, it was a sour cream ice cream, and artisanal cheese. So. What, which one you want to eat more, right? You want to eat all the, all the processed food, the normal donut or what, or you want to eat something like that, right? So the leaders actually, and, and I think a lot of these, these recipes are actually in line with a lot of the traditional uh, thing. Okay, good foods and good fats and that. So uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time on the fat side. Uh, he mentioned that, she talked to lipid scientists, right? Not the normal doctors or normal nutritionists. He looked for the doctors that sole focus is to look at the impact of fats and oil, which are lipids, on human health. He said that many of them believe that. <clears throat> so this is actually contrary to a lot of the a lot of the health advice. But I actually have some nuanced take on this one. I'll share it on that the polyunsaturated fatty acids cause the stiffening of arteries. And actually, actually, what's worse than that is actually an oxidized uh, PUFA because uh, they, they are chemically unstable. Also, he want to mention that traditional fats are not the problem, but the problem is all the fats we eat that are actually refined, bleached, deodorized. The processing of them that actually cause the problem. So what is... Uh, so this is a bit more chemistry, uh, but uh, I, I try to go through very quickly. Uh. What is saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated fat? I think the main difference is most of this look the same, uh, right? But you can see the top one is uh, saturated fat. The saturated, monounsaturated, <laughs> polyunsaturated fat. The difference is that the saturated fat in the chain, uh, the long chain area, right? It doesn't have any double bond or single bond. So what happens is that the fat is actually very chemically stable, but right? it's not so easy to uh, it's not so easy to oxidize, and and then monounsaturated yeah have one double bond, but as you go down right the last two are polyunsaturated fat, the the middle one is omega six and then the last one is omega three where they have a lot of these double bonds, uh, and these double bonds are the problem because double bonds are prone to oxidation, right? The oxygen may react with it. And what will happen is when they react, they actually, the chemical will change to something else. In fact, uh, she gave a name for it, omega trans fat. If we know that trans fat is not good uh, because 
because humans actually purposely go and uh, hydrogenate it. But she said that actually even a normal uh, unsaturated fat, if it gets heated up and oxidized, actually it creates a lot of different products that are actually not good for us. And uh, what will happen is, um, this picture is a really uh, not so clear, right? But what happened is that there are always some free radicals inside the blood vessels or all around our body, which are actually electrons. That uh, if they, it, it, uh, if the if these fats are actually oxidized, they actually release a lot of the free radicals. And you can think of it like uh, like explosion, right? If you oxidize, it means there is some burning or explosion going on. So imagine you you have too much of this fat in your body. There's a lot of explosion happening inside the blood vessel. And then you will release all these free radicals and then damage the cells on your body because a lot of our cells have the polyunsaturated fat because it's, it's needed for our cells. And so if these free radicals will react and then damage the, uh, the cells. And so every time these oils are present anywhere in the body, too much of it actually, then you have caused a lot of problems, right? In the blood vessel, in the skin, in the guts, in the brain. Uh, of course, uh, in the real food, uh, in, in real food, the content of the fat is actually not just one type of fat. It's actually a distribution. They have all three types of fats in all the different oils that you have. But uh, what we should pay attention to is those fats that are a bit very, very high in uh, polyunsaturated fats, she recommends to avoid. Uh, you, and, and the fats like saturated fat is actually uh, very, very stable, right? So they don't oxidize so easily inside the body. Okay, so, uh, so this is a list, right? So you can see that most of the animal fats and the uh, tropical fat, right? Like coconut oil and butter, and ghee, they have higher percentage of saturated fat, so they are more stable. And things from the seed, like corn, safflower, mm. soybean oil, those are actually very, very high in the unsaturated. Mm. Uh, you, it was there a question or something? Uh, yeah, you answered it. <laughs> okay. So um, there's something about the lipid cycle. When you di what happens when you digest the fat? Right. So it's going to get a bit technical, but I. I like to know what's happening, uh, so I like, share. Uh, when you digest the fat, the fat cannot go into your blood because the uh, fat and water don't mix, right? So they cannot actually, they cannot actually, um, they cannot, they cannot mix inside the blood. Actually, if you have a lot of fat in the blood, I think uh, what I think if you do a blood test, right? I think they have something called like glycerate or something like that. Uh, it's a okay. it's a fat fat inside your blood. If that is very high. You see that you're not supposed to see a lot of fat inside the blood. Right, so what they do is there's this uh, superhero, she draw, uh, she called that the lipoprotein. Right, it means there's a cell, um, the liver, like uh, when you digest it, it in, let's say the liver is processing your fat, the liver actually can create these lipoproteins and it would, it would uh, put all the fat and related stuff inside there, right? You can see here they have uh, fat and cholesterol, vitamin A, D, E, K, choline, lecithin, you know, all kinds of different uh, fat soluble stuff. They are all contained inside these lipoproteins, right? And then you definitely heard of them because they are all on different types of lipoprotein, right? The most famous one are the high density and the low density lipoprotein, HDL, LDL, right? And that's what you normally do when you go for a test, you look for cholesterol. Normally, they count how much HDL LDL you have, right? But they actually have a purpose, right? They are, they are a delivery mechanism. And, uh, and another important part of this is the outside of it, there's a coating, right? There's a coating that's actually like a label. It tells the body, okay, I have some fat inside here, okay? Or I want, I have some fat inside here. What is this package, right? Uh, I, I often think about it in a technical way. I say, oh, this looks like a packet, uh, right? Uh, either a PCIe packet or a TCP IP packet. You have a, inside a packet, there's a header, 
that tells the router or the endpoint what is what is my content, right? And then the fat itself is the payload, the data itself. So I can think of that's why when I think about HDR IDL, I think about like packets moving around your body, uh, looking for uh, looking for uh, it's like a delivery system. In fact, if I go to the website, she actually mentioned it like a delivery system. So uh, she used the analogy of uh, of uh, Uber Eats. So for us, it would be Food Panda or Grab, right? That you deliver with a bicycle food to a place. So what happens is that there'll be an address, right? Where to deliver to, which is the Apple protein. And then there will be the there will be the content, which is the fat and cholesterol. So as it travels in the body, parts of your body will need it, right? Your brain needs a lot of fat. Uh, parts of your body will need the fat to, to, or cholesterol to build different hormones. So at those areas in the body, you see there are receptors that will read that, uh, will read that part of the uh, um, protein and then take the fat in, to take it and then use it. So that's how it's supposed to work. But uh, there is a problem, as mentioned before, right? If you have too much of those uh, unsaturated fat inside the body, and maybe you also have a lot of sugar, if you have a high blood sugar, uh, there's a lot of oxidation going on, right? So on the left side is a normal LDL, very healthy LDL that do the normal delivery. The second case is when you have too much of the polyunsaturated fat, you take too much refined fat, soybean oil, uh, you know, safflower oil, highly processed pure oil, right? No antioxidant, no. Like if I take actual soybean, I take actual sunflower, it's a different thing than the sunflower oil or soybean oil because of all the natural things inside, right? But without that, you only have the pure oil and they're easily oxidized. And sometimes because you cook with heat, right? When you go in, the body is already oxidized. So it means that now these parts are part of the delivery. So whatever they now instead of delivering a very nice oil, right? Now they're delivering a bomb to the parts of the body. So it, it so it means it goes to the body and then the body receive it, but it's poison, right? The third case is I mentioned before the apple protein, the header, right? The, the address of the uh, the address of this uh, deeper protein that can get damaged as well, right? If you have a lot of uh, if you have a lot of this uh, oxidation in your blood vessel, it actually damage the lipoprotein. protein. Okay, and what will happen is that now now the grab driver uh, don't know where they have to send it to. Uh. The address is gone, right? They don't know where to send it. So it means this lipoprotein, protein, uh, they don't want to do uh, just just coming around the body. So I think this is one of the reasons. Be so because people will say that if you eat a lot of saturated fat, you have a lot of LDL, right? Uh, actually, she mentioned that the ratio of HDL is to LDL actually more important than LDL. But let's talk about LDL. You, you, why you have a lot of LDL when you eat saturated fat is because the fat needs to go to the body, right? So it means that they generate your LDL so that it can move the fat around. But another reason why your cholesterol will be high is if this uh, if this package is uh, the packet is uh, spoiled, you don't know where the address is. Then what you're gonna have a lot of lost LDL floating around the <laughs> blood vessel. They don't know what to do. Mm. And if you have a lot of this, right? So I mean, this is this is what I I interpreted from what you said, uh, right? That you have a lot of. Uh, there are two cases where you can have high LDL, right? It could be you eat a lot of saturated fat. So it could be high, but I think after they process the fat, I think the LDL should go low again. But if you uh, have a lot of damage LDL, then I, I can understand why you accumulate a lot. Of, you, keep, you eat a lot, a lot of bad things, and then the LDL is oxidized, and then uh, lots of them float around the body. So what sense is that? Eventually, what will happen to this LDL that has no way to go? If the liver can intercept it and process it, good up. But if you have no way to go, they actually die. Right? And then inside there, all the fat uh, go into your bloodstream. So uh, my guess is that probably this is one of the reasons why people have more fat, could get more fat in the blood because the, the destroyed uh, LDL can, 
And uh, once it gets destroyed, these, these, these things will interact with the cell. The gas yeah. is not a fact, the gas is not a fact. The gas is not a fact, <laughs> it's a gas, right? <laughs> uh, if you need to check to see whether I'm correct or not. So anyway, right, a lot of these kind of explosives uh, inside your blood is going to interact with the cell, and then it's going to cause a lot of damage, right? And, and that's probably a more better explanation of why you can cause injury to artery and a heart attack. Because okay. you have an injury, that's why the body has to uh, heal it, right? That's why they put a lot of plaque and things to protect it. So, uh, it, um, and, and actually cholesterol is also meant to, to heal the wound, right? That's how the body uses it. And that's why you see a lot of these plaques have a lot of cholesterol inside. But actually the mechanism of heart attack, apparently, apparently, right? It's not the, it's not really just, it's not really the tightening of the, the, the artery becomes small. It's actually when there's a new, when they are damaged uh, and then uh, the blood comes up from the wall and then you have blood clot. So I, uh, what, what she said in the book is that a more bigger problem is that you have a damaged artery that's not repaired, right? And then the blood comes out and it clots and then it blocks the artery. That's actually what really, really causes the heart attack. Okay. Yeah, one hour now. Oh, one hour, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so she put a very long list of good pets and bad pets. Uh, I cannot go through all, but what she said in general, uh, that the seed and vegetable oil are very unstable. Uh, and you, you'll notice that um, the way I, I, I read this is that she preferred natural oil because you see on the left side, the good oil, right? Olive oil, avocado oil, peanut oil. Uh, a lot of these also have some polyunsaturated fat inside, right? Uh, there are certain things they mention, right? The heat, be careful about heat, like a fish oil and walnut oil and things like that, right? But he didn't say that you shouldn't eat it because he thinks that those things have less processing. They don't go to the whole industrial process. And so it has the, it has the things attached to it, like the antioxidant, like the vitamins and uh, whatever, and uh, the oxygen that they are <coughs> to uh, protect. So uh, that's why she also mentioned that I, the way I feel is that quantity is the thing that matters, right? Uh, the problem is that people take too much of these very, very bad fats. So the way I, the way I um, look at this is that I'm not so scared of the saturated fat, but I don't purposely eat a lot. Also, right, and so, uh, but if you, but if the main oil you use is like uh, safflower oil, cottonseed oil, it's a big problem, right? Especially if you use it for fried stuff, donuts, which will suck a lot of oil. Then you eat a lot of the oil without any of the natural things that the uh, natural oil, like uh, extra virgin olive oil, would have. Um, she talked about sugar. Actually, I didn't write, I didn't, um, I didn't, I don't say too much about sugar because people already know a lot of the issues with sugar. But she, but the main dynamic of what causes problem with sugar is what she call the advanced glycogen end products, AGE. It just means that when the sugar interacts with the protein, it becomes, it groups together and becomes sticky. So you say that, for example, if you hold the sugar, right? And then it, uh, and it will interact with the protein on your skin, it will start to become sticky. So he said that, you know, that kind of thing that is inside the body uh, would, would, would cause problems. Kidneys will normally clean it up, but too much of it will cause the hardening of the tissues. So I think uh, the key word is too much, uh, right? Uh, I, I personally don't have so much issue, you know, if you eat a lot of really sugar or carbohydrate diet, because, because a lot of because a lot of people, they eat only fruits or, you know, only uh, vegetables with really, really high carbohydrates and they're still very healthy, right? So the bigger problem would be if the person has high blood sugar. I think sugar is only a really big problem when they have a high blood sugar, which I think is caused by a lot of metabolic problems. Okay, so if uh, sugar would be an issue, if your sugar level, if your blood sugar is already very, very high. So in example, uh, she said 
this level, right? This this level is actually not a diabetic level. They said that if your blood sugar, fasting blood sugar is around this level, like 4.9, uh, you should already start to reduce the sugar intake to control it so that uh, you don't have a lot of problems. One thing that she mentioned is uh, interesting is that uh, high sugar is just one observation, but because it was so interesting, I just put it there. Huh? She said if you have high blood sugar, it, it, one of the symptoms is actually the careless seals. It's not diabetic, right? It's relatively high sugar. So uh, it means that if your heel is often very, very dry, and thick and you know flaky, there's a high chance that you have very uh, high blood sugar. Mm -hmm. So uh, five more minutes. Yeah, you maybe ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Sir. Okay. The okay. The last part, living the deep nutrition way. So there, are, she have four pillars of uh, how to uh, guidelines on the diets that you eat. The first one is called the meat cook on the bone. Uh, it means that you should eat meat as a whole, right? Not, uh, not you know, isolating things, right? And if you're if you're cooking meat, uh, avoid overcooking because the nutrients get killed and then it's harder to digest. The second thing is uh, use moisture, time, and pots. So uh, you shouldn't let the meat dry out because there will be you get less nutrition. And uh, you some one way you can do it is that you do a slow cook and cook it slowly. And parts, right? It means that use more parts of the animal. You don't cook only, it, try not to only cook the meat. You cook the bone, the skin, the fat, the ligament all together. Because all of these things have a lot of uh, nutrients. Also, uh, use the fats because fat gives more flavor and there's a lot of fat soluble nutrients that are inside there. So uh, don't be too, don't be so scared of the. The, the animal fat, that's what she mentioned. Uh, last one, actually this is one of the more important one, make bone stock. So the, the bone marrow or the bone, right, it contains a lot of nutrients, huge amount of vitamins and minerals, and it also has things like glucosamine and collagen that are actually really good for our, our body. The second part is the organ meats. Uh, it's uh, rich in vitamins and minerals. So it's a comparison right in the middle is the so this is something that I don't yeah this is something that I don't often do also oh, I don't often eat this but uh, this is her recommendation it said that the liver uh, in the middle right if you compare all the parameters of vitamin A B C folate uh, you know pentotelic acid and magnesium a lot more of those are actually found in the in the organ meat uh, something else that I do not eat right uh, the eyeballs uh are very rich in lutein something that's actually very good for the eyes and also high hyaluronic acids uh this is i think what people use in their facial products because it's very very good for the skin uh brain right uh a lot of the if you eat the brains of the animal they, you get a lot of the healthy omega-3 as i mentioned before the adrenal glands have vitamin c uh, the third pillar is uh, fermentation and sprouting. Uh, he says that a lot of plants don't want to be eaten. Right? So a lot of time we, we take a plant and just eat it. Right? But, but there's a problem because the seeds, uh, especially the seeds, right, they don't want to be eaten. And so a lot of times they have some natural poison inside there or things that would bind to your, you know, bind to your mineral and you don't digest minerals very well. So he says that to make uh, uh, try to ensure that you do some fermentation or sprouting, right? To uh, to to make that nutrition available. So I think example of sprout. I think what we I I can think of is the bean sprout. Right? <laughs> Why it's a, it's an important bean. I I think you know, when it is sprout, also it means that you can leave the bean you know in the water or leave it for some time. I think once you start to sprout a little bit, open up a bit, then you can use it to cook. I think that's what. They say, yeah. And this applies to a lot of things. And then here's some example of a lot of things that are fermented, right? Wine is a fermented grape. Bread, especially the sourdough bread, right? Yogurt, chocolate, sauerkraut, all of these are examples of things that are spotted or fermented. And also, uh, why you want to ferment the food is because if you have bacteria, fungi, and yeast, right, they actually 
break down a lot of toxin and they change the food. They create a lot of vitamins and minerals available to us. Uh, also, a lot of the fermented stuff have probiotics, so it boosts the immune system. And uh, she gave an example that if you want to take wheat, this is something that is very rare, using only the spotted wheat uh, to, to, to make bread. Uh, you, can, you can refer to the book, and she has a lot of details about that. Okay, the last pillar is uh, the benefits of raw. Why you should focus on the fresh fruits, vegetables, and spices. Uh, the, usually, right, if the veggie and the fruits have very strong taste and very pungent taste, it means that they have more antioxidants. Uh, and this helps to balance out a lot of loss nutrients in the cooked food. Right, so uh, the way she looked at the vegetables, the fruits, I think it's more like they have a lot of... Uh, they have a lot of these antioxidants that are very, very beneficial to us. And I think uh, Billy also mentioned a lot of fiber, <laughs> right? They are very good for, for us. And so it balances a lot of the loss nutrients. You cook, for, you cook the meat, sometimes they, they, you cook the meat or you take a lot of the very bad oil, right? You need some of the antioxidants to help, uh, help you, right? So that the oil doesn't... Um, doesn't cause problems in the body. Uh, just now, something I didn't mention which is, uh, I mentioned, right, the fat, you have the polyunsaturated fat that easily explode inside the body, right? So isn't that a normal occurrence? Yeah, and yes, it, even if you have a very healthy diet, this kind of oxidation will happen, right? But the difference is that you would have more antioxidants inside your blood to help uh, stop this from being a very big event. And if you take too much of the bad fat, uh, there are too many explosions that are not enough firefighters to help protect. And I think another thing he mentioned about the questions is that try not to wait. Right? You, if, if you uh, store in too many days inside the fridge, the, the nutrition factor it goes low. And he said that actually sometimes cooking the food is good because eating veggies, sometimes they have a lot of the cellulose that trap the nutrient. You need to cook it to release it. So even if you cook it, right, uh, if it's fresh and then you cook it for a short period of time, you still have more nutrients than you store it for a long period of time. Lastly, uh, she recommend uh, raw milk. Uh, uh, I don't think, and uh, for instance, uh, cellulite is an example, right? Uh, where the collagens are arranged nicely, the fat cells are all very tightly packed, but if the collagen is like loose, right, then you get this kind of problem, right? Very big chunks. And so they get, they get exposed and then they, they, they look like cellulite. And you cannot, although people will say, I'll mention later on, but you can supplement with collagen to help, but it actually covers everything in the book. Right? You need to do everything to get a good collagen health because the, the, the because you can eat collagen is just to give enough of the material, but you need to tell the body uh, Give it the right condition, low inflammation, good nutrition to, to do it. Uh, and it says that why inflammation can damage the collagen? Because inflammation actually is either you have bacteria that attack you, or you have a lot of these really bad oxidized fat, right? That the body say, wait, what, who are you? It's a foreign substance to the white blood cell, right? So the white blood cell will attack it. And in this example, the white blood cell is shooting a, they call it a free radical gun. So the, one way the one way the white blood cell protect you is that uh, it has a it has a machine gun that shoots free radicals to destroy all the foreign cells, and uh, it's supposed to destroy bacteria. But sometimes if it uh, recognizes weird things like the oxidized fat, right, it may attack that also. And when that happens, it damages the collagen because it's on the surface of your skin, right. So you you may have uh, acne and wrinkles. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's, um, I mentioned before, things that can help a bit on the collagen side, like enough sunshine, vitamin D, and bone broth and stock to, to supplement on the collagen, but in reality, it's actually everything. Okay. Uh, it's a very long book, as I mentioned. You can see all the, this is more like a kind of, a, like a trailer, like more like, showing the surface area that I saw to be very interesting. But inside the book itself, there are more details. There's a very long FAQs area. Uh, something stop eating, maybe the body 
want to protect the fat even more. Or maybe the fat cell will shrink, right? But the fat cell is still there. And one of the ways uh, to solve to to uh, to give the right signal is of course eat a really healthy yeah collagen health right uh collagen collagen um collagen is something that's available in almost all the tissues inside our body right and uh, and there's a special one they call elastin which is actually made when we are very young and it's supposed to last for a long period of time so if you have a lot of elastin uh you would actually look young until you're very old, right? So this one, but but the problem about making collagen is that it's very sensitive to the it's very sensitive to the nutrition and the inflammation in the body. But if your nutrition is not good, the the way the collagen grows is not going to be good, and then you may get like premature wrinkling. You can see it on the surface area of the body, although it also happens in all the cells in the body, right? A lot of wrinkling, and um, for instance, uh, cellulite is an example, right? Uh, where the collagens are arranged nicely, the fat cells are all very tightly packed. But if the collagen is like loose, right, then you get this kind of problem, right? Very big chunks, and so they get they get exposed, and then they they, they look like something like. And you cannot, although people will say I'll mention later on, but right, you can supplement with collagen to help. But it actually covers everything in the book, right? You need to do everything to get a good collagen health because. The the col the because you can eat collagen is just to give enough of the material, but you need to tell the body, uh, give it the right condition, low inflammation, good nutrition to to do it. Uh, and it says that why inflammation can damage the collagen because inflammation actually is either you have bacteria that attack you, or you have a lot of these really bad oxidized fat, right? That the body say, wait, what? Who are you? It's a foreign substance to the white blood cell, right? So the white blood cell will attack it. And in this example, the white blood cell is shooting a they call it a free radical gun. So the one way the one way the white blood cell protect you is that uh, it has a it has a machine gun that shoots free radicals to destroy all the foreign cells. And uh, it's supposed to destroy bacteria, but sometimes if it uh, recognizes weird things like the oxidized fat, right? It may attack that also, and when that happens, it damages the collagen because it's on the surface of your skin, right? So you you may have uh, acne and wrinkles. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's um, I mentioned before, things that can help a bit on the collagen side, like enough sunshine, vitamin D, and bone broth and stock to to supplement on the collagen. But in reality, it's actually everything. Okay. Uh, it's a very long book, as I mentioned. You can see all the. This is more like a kind of a, like a trailer, like more like showing the surface area that I saw to be very interesting. But inside the book itself, there are more details. There's a very long FAQs area, uh, supplement guidelines and recipes. So I really encourage you to uh, look at the book. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. So that's the uh, end of my presentation. Okay, uh, I. I also sort of learn my nutrition from YouTube, uh, okay? Oh. Uh, so there are two camps here. Uh, that one is saying that um, what you need to care is all about calories, okay? What you put in calories in. Uh. The other camp says that you don't need to care about that. You just need to make sure that you eat all process, uh, non-processed food, okay? Okay, and they say that, you know, calorie counting is useless, uh. okay? So what are your thoughts on that? Uh? Uh. Calorie, yeah. this is a different topic, but uh, I'll, I, I mean, it's the same. Personal, yeah. My personal thought uh, is uh, I thought about, I think, uh, I think both of them would have their merits. I think uh, if somebody is uh, having a problem with their metabolism, then uh, it's very, very hard to lose weight. And I think because of, related, related to here, right, they mentioned that if you're sending your body a wrong signal, uh, you probably cannot lose weight so easily, right? Uh, and 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 I still believe uh, that carry counting is is relevant for two reasons. Number one is that uh, actually one reason uh, because cal because you, if you eat too many calories and you don't use the energy, right? For me, is uh, in and out. Uh, in general, if you eat a lot more calories, you're gonna get better. 
that's my understanding, right? People would say that there could be other ways that the, the calories would, uh, can come out. Some people believe that uh, it can be, it, the fat can come out of the set, some people said, right? Or, or some people say you claim that your metabolism is very high, so the calories will not go up. But I feel like a lot of the, those diets that they say they don't count calories, there is a calorie deficit. So their argument is that when you eat non-processed food, uh, your body itself will tell you your food yeah, already. Yeah, so I think yeah. the, I think it works because they get enough nutrient, nutrients. Because I think one reason why people feel hungry all the time is because they don't have enough nutrition. So the body, like the pregnant mom, will get hungry, right? Because uh, the baby wants something. And, and, and yes, sometimes the mother will know what to eat. That's why she eats certain, certain food. But like guys are asked, right? The body only knows that we need nutrients. It's not enough. Keep eating until you have the nutrients. So you keep eating. So you keep eating, eating, eating until the body uh, finds that nutrient and then you don't feel hungry anymore. That's my theory. <laughs> okay. Uh, but in general, I think the calorie deficit is quite important because I personally also, you know, didn't care so much and I was 10, 10 kg heavier, right? So recently, I actually started to have uh, take less calories in general, and then only my weight started to drop. So I think, yeah, it's still relevant, but for the people who have big issues with the weight, right, maybe, you know, the first step is to eat more natural food. Okay, let me get one question from the chat. So Xin Cheng asked that, can you talk more about palm oil fat? They are high in saturated fat, but usually used in processed food for good shelf storage. So is it good or is it bad? Actually, if you check the FAQ, right, she would say that she's actually very un undetermined by the, the palm oil. The problem is uh, the processing of it. Right? Okay, the high saturated fat, although it will raise the, the LDL in general, right, it actually makes the oil very stable. So that's the good part. But the bad part is that how do they process it, right? So if you look at the, just now the list, right, the refined palm oil, they actually put it at the bad fat portion because uh, you cannot determine how they process the oil. So it could be in, in bad. In general, uh, you prefer it to be in a natural form. The co uh, Yeah. But uh, the one thing is, um, I also mentioned just now well, how I deal with this issue is that there's palm oil everywhere, right? Uh, is that quantity is important, right? Quantity is important. You don't purposely, I don't purposely go eat fried stuff in general because especially with metal, right? Because you have the flour actually, actually uh, would receive a lot of the, the oil. So I used to eat the fried uh, roti john. Have you eaten that before? Oh yeah, fried John is uh, is uh <laughs> they uh it's soaked like the the oil goes into the the bread is very thick uh, and all the oil goes in a uh, while. <laughs> that is an uh, example of a bad case of might be too much right. If you have a lot of normal food that a little bit of oil there, and then you eat enough uh, antioxidant, I think I think the body is able to handle it. Right. I think the problem is that when there's too much, that's the issue. And I think Malaysians probably eat too much fried food. Yeah. So yeah, can we take three more questions? If we yeah, can't finish, yeah. you reply sure. then offline. Uh. Sure. <laughs> Anyone in the room? Question? Okay. Uh, the next one, if we take cholesterol pills, what happens? You mean the lowering of cholesterol? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Uh, so it will just reduce the LDL. So they, uh, in the book, she mentioned that the risk, I forgot the actual number, right? Maybe you have a 20% risk of a heart attack you know, with a very high LDL, right, you may have an extra risk of heart attack. So if you take the, the pill, it will have, you should, it will reduce the amount, it would uh, reduce the amount of LDL, I think, the liver create, and it also uh, makes it faster for the liver to destroy the LDL. I think something like that. You need to research uh, what does the statin do. Uh, uh, it, will re it would, in general, reduce the, supposed to reduce the risk of the, uh, because they have a study that showed that if you reduce your LDL by from a certain number or certain number, your risk of the heart attack and stroke will drop. Mm. But but she mentioned that the risk difference is not very big. It means like maybe a twenty percent risk become fifteen percent risk. 
So uh, she says that uh, it's more important to check on your HDL level that's, that's high enough. Uh, and then, of course, everything else in the book, because if you have a healthy, uh, if you have a healthy lifestyle and a healthy diet, the LDL should not be high as well. Mm. Right? And then, of course, I think the, the, the drugs may have some side effects. So I actually don't know what's the, what, what side effects they are. Yeah. Uh, James asks, based on this, we should not take olive oil, by question mark. Seems uh, like it's opposite to the general nutrition advice. Olive oil is actually, if you look at the list I show, right, it's actually in the fats that are the good fats, right? And um, the reason, uh, the only olive oil that she would not recommend is the refined olive oil or the olive pomace oil or something like that. The processed, highly processed olive oil. Because uh, olive oil is a mono mostly a monounsaturated fat, it's not. It only has one double bond, so it's not as reactive as the polyunsaturated fat. Actually, right, the most reactive of them all is actually omega three. You mean the peel? I mean we took the omega three. Um, yeah, I mean omega three oil in general. It has three double bonds. It's actually the most reactive. Yeah, and uh, and so um. The important thing about omega-3, all these oils, it's not that they themselves are bad, but it's that you take too much, it's a problem. And then they are not in their natural form. In the olive oil, the virgin olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, if you taste it, uh, it's a bit spicier because there are a lot of antioxidants inside that actually protect the oil from getting spoiled. And then, um, and then, and that's why she also mentioned it's a bit dangerous to eat Normally, normal eat normal fish oil because a lot of fish oil they are actually oxidized. Because omega three, right? It's very easy to get oxidized. It's better to eat fresh fish or maybe some shellfish or you know the the natural seafood that's not cooked too much. That's actually a better source of the omega three because uh, it's in the fish itself. It has all the protective magic things uh, inside the the fish that that protects it from being oxidized. Ask one more question, one more question, and then the rest of the question you could take it offline. Now. <laughs> okay, is chia seed good to consume it daily? What? As chia seed, C H I A. Okay. Uh, as it's categorized as superfood. I think uh, I didn't research on the chia seed, but if it's but people normally don't cook it, right? They just eat it or they put it in the water. So I don't think that the I think in general she mentioned that uh, the food that you take in a natural form. But usually not very bad. Mm. Uh, but well, of course, anything that you eat shouldn't be in excess. Uh. Yeah. All right. Any more questions from the room? Yeah. Josh. All right. I think I think we are at eleven thirty. We should be done. And I want to thank those that are coming in today. Before I conclude, I want to say this thing. The front part of what Spigat had mentioned, I give me a bit anxious because like, ah, if you are the second child, then you are not symmetry, right? <laughs> so, uh, actually, I, I don't know. I, I, I did a Google. The Aaron Cock, uh, you see, on uh, the nine or something, uh, he is not the first child. <laughs> so, so uh, <laughs> you're high chance that you are good. So, <laughs> yeah. So, you can see that uh, um, it's not it's not all, all the time uh, like that. Uh. Mm. And, uh, and you should ask his mom what he ate uh, and the grandmother. Ah, yeah, yeah. That's just very, <laughs> that's, a, that's a more interesting information. Uh, yeah. Eat well, live well, not just for yourself, but for your next generation as well, right? Yeah. So, uh, this is the time that we have for today. Thanks for joining the 10 10 Book of Sharing. Thanks to get for coming yeah. and uh, sharing wonderful stuff with us. Yeah. <laughs> this is all the time that we have. Thank you for tuning in to the 10 10 Book Club, where we share book club sharing every first Monday of the month. If you like video like this, do remember to subscribe to us and also check out the video that I recommended over here. It will help you to enhance your knowledge and become a better person and be more health conscious as well. Alright, I'll catch up with you soon and see you next month. Bye-bye.